what is a priest? You can think of it from the Jewish tradition, you can think of it from the Catholic Church, where that title is used, other denominations uh, is used. I'm thinking within the, the Judeo-Christian pattern, but how would you define what a priest is? What's a priest? Speak up, listen loud. Holy a holy father, a leader, shepherd. shepherd. What's a priest? A man. What's that? A man. Okay. A teacher. Shepherd, yeah. A representative for God. That's cool. Intercessor. An intercessor. Good. Cool. Yep. What's a priest? All right, if that's the definition we're starting with, are you a priest? Do all those things fit? Mom said man. How many women? Okay. Priest. 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 Still priests. Still pri Are you a priest? Intercessor, teacher, shepherd, leader. I don't know. That's what I want to dig into. The, the definitions that we have and the concept of what that means will determine whether we think that that's us or not. I hope to make the case clearly from Scripture that every one of us is a priest, but it's going to require us to deconstruct a little bit what you think a priest is and what a priest does. Otherwise, you will never think you are a priest and you will never act like a priest. And then, therefore, you will not fulfill the fact that God calls you to be a priest. So this is a deconstruction and a reconstruction. Um, am I a priest? Yes. Priest. Okay. I'm a priest. Are you the same kind of priest as me? Yes. Yes. Everyone, one, two, three. Yes. Because if you don't believe that, then you are selling yourself short on what the Holy Spirit will do for you. You're going to elevate me past my point of competence. And you will refer to me things that you could be doing in the kingdom. You will delegate. You will defer. You will settle. You won't see. You won't experience. You won't be. I am not different from you. I serve in a role in a body. I help to teach. I help to lead. I am not the only teacher. I am not the only leader. I am one of. And I'm just a Christian. And God doesn't only use me as a teacher. So it means I should never show hospitality or I should never do administration, or I should never heal, or I should never... No, all those things are asked of me, but aren't all those things asked of you? So the same. We help each other, and some are called to certain like roles within the body as helping. If there's skill there, or if there's gifting, God uses us. The definition of priest is Christian. This means we need to break down the clergy and laity barriers. By the way, it's not a thing. Not anymore. And so the way I'd like to do that is I'd like to look at eight roles that the priests had in the Old Testament. I'm just simply going to put them on the wall, read them quickly to you, and then we're going to think about them. And we're going to see that Jesus and every one of these things is the ultimate priest, the beautiful, perfect, perfect high priest. And then immediately you're going to be able to see, but yeah, this is supposed to be us too. And all of this is meant to be an experimental faith type of sermon, which is why I said that at the beginning. I hope that you will go out and I will go out this week trying to fulfill the role of priests in the world. Because that's what we're called to do. It's our title, it's our position, it's our function, it's our joy, it's our power, it's our love. It's, it's, it's what Jesus is and what he calls us to be. So when we're looking at a little bit of context here, when we're looking at the priests in the Old Testament, there was Aaron, who was the older brother of Moses. They're both of, both of the tribe of Levi. And Aaron and his descendants were the Levites. So all of the Levites had priestly functions and roles. And within that, there were specific people that act as priests, the teacher, the high priest. So there were specific positions, but the Levites as a whole had this priestly function. Remember the book of Leviticus, Old Testament? The Levite's book. 
It's instructions about how to go about being a priest. So all of these scriptures I'm going to pull on with maybe one exception are from Exodus, are from Leviticus, are from Deuteronomy, describing what these priests were. But before I read to you something from 1,500 years ago, let's read from, let's say, well, I would say 3,500 years ago. Let's read from Jesus' time from the book of Hebrews about 2,000 years ago and put it into perspective. Hebrews 10 1 to 2, and then I'm going to skip a little bit because he elaborates, the author, in 12 through 16, say this. For since the law, so this is your whole Old Testament, it's the Old Covenant, the law of Moses, since the law was but a shadow, some translations say has but a shadow, it's like a foreshadowing, it's a forecasting, it's a prediction, it's a, a type of the one. Since the law was but a shadow of the good things to come, meaning Christ and the church and the kingdom of heaven for all, since the law is but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. So the ancient Jewish rituals, they could grant forgiveness, but they could not grant perfection. Which one is required to get into heaven? Perfection, And since none of us can reach perfection on our own, that's why we all need Jesus. His perfection becomes ours. So there was forgiveness granted, but it did not make perfect, and it did not finish it once and for all. Otherwise, the author writes, would they not have ceased to be offered all these sacrifices, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin? If you did it and it worked, isn't it done? But no, it's a temporary, a forecast, a shadow of what to come. So skipping now to verse 12. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified, being made into God's people, being purified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. So this is exactly my sermon in a nutshell. The Old Testament priest, Christ once for all, and us as an extension of Jesus. The Holy Spirit bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, declares the Lord, the Holy Spirit said, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And the book of Hebrews goes on. But that's where we live now. We have the Holy Spirit in us. So we, we think and breathe and feel. We become instinctively godly and more and more so over time versus just ritualistically godly. It's implanted versus practiced. The practice now comes from the implanted nature of God within us through the Holy Spirit, which is given by Christ because he rose from the dead and poured out his spirit in all people. So if you can follow that train of thought, that's the context for everything that we're talking about. And here are the eight things that I want us to know. This is God's definition of priesthood because these are God's laws given to his priests. You are God's priests. Therefore, there's going to be an application point in all these things for you and for me. The first one, Aaron and the Levites were garbed as priests. It's how they dressed. It's how they presented themselves to the world. It's how they were clothed. Exodus 28, 40 to 41 says, For Aaron's sons, you shall make coats and sashes and caps. And this is one of the more beautiful verses I've come across in a long time. God says, you shall make them for glory and beauty. Mm. I feel like we could just stop and just sing for a while. They were clothed for glory and beauty. Why? Because God has so much glory and so much beauty. Beauty is God's invention. To do things beautifully. To create beauty, being creative. 
to recognize God's beauty, not just his justice or his permission or his grace, his beauty. This is how the priests were clothed. And then you shall put these things on Aaron, your brother. Obviously, God is talking to Moses. This is instructive. And on his sons with him. And then you shall anoint them. So there's oil on the head. You shall ordain them. You are commissioned. Go in this priestly role. And you shall consecrate them. Be pure. Be sanctified. You are sent that they may serve me as priests. Think about the glory and beauty of God for a minute. Come on. Come on. That's so profound. It's so good. Not just what does God say to you, not just what does God mean, not just what can I learn about him, not just what do I need from God, not just functional relationship. The glory, the radiance, you know, glory as in like the light that pushes out, like when you get too close to a campfire, like the campfire, where is Rachel? She is there, yeah, the campfire we had yesterday, you get close enough, you just feel it kind of like pulsing, out, radiating out, the glory of God. But the beauty is just so beautiful. And if you've grown up with a concept of God where he's this wrathful, vindictive being in heaven, think about his people are meant to show he's beautiful. And just let that sit with you for a minute. That was the single most moving thing I read all week. And it's all good. But this, to me, was the diamond of all of it. In Exodus 28, 36 to 38, another part of the garb of the Levites, God said, you shall make a plate of pure gold. I guess it couldn't have been that big. It's going to go on their forehead, as we'll see in a second. But a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet, holy to the Lord. This is who these men were to the world, literally, on their forehead. Not in a piece of wood, not in some scraps that they found, in pure gold for the glory, for the beauty. And everyone who saw them saw the glory and the beauty and knew they represented God. Not their glory, not man's glory, God's glory. Not their beauty, their attractiveness or their abilities, God's beauty because they were garbed with these breastplates and these sashes and these turbans and holy to the Lord was in gold on their forehead. So just take it to Jesus. What do we see in Jesus more than the glory and the beauty? It's just such a great definition of Jesus. The glory and the beauty. He didn't need the gold plaque on his head. He wore the dirty clothes, not the precious ones. And yet everyone who saw him and everything we read about him in the pages of scripture is the beauty and the glory of God. He can't even help it. It radiates off him. And everyone saw it. Some hated him for it. Some couldn't stand it. But it was who he was. Take a minute and think about the glory and the beauty of Jesus. Not just the teacher. Not just the healer. Not just the functional relationship. The glory and the beauty. We're meant to be God's priests. Are we clothed with glory and beauty? Is that what people would feel radiating from us? Is that how we talk? Is that what we wear? Is that how we conduct ourselves? Do people see us and see glory and beauty? I know from listening to the world around me as I've grown that most people look at believers and don't see glory. And so they wonder if our God has any glory. And that's on us. It's not on God. And that's not on Jesus. They're all the glory, all the beauty. Let us live into that glory and garb ourselves with it. Doesn't matter what you're wearing. Doesn't matter how you look. It's not that. It's who you are. And the beauty. I know when much of the world looks at Christians, they don't see beauty. Why? We serve the most beautiful Messiah. It was an incarnation of the most beautiful God. We should be beautiful to the world. And that has nothing to do with our face, our appearance, our body types. Nothing, zero to do with that. 
The Bible says that Jesus had none of those things that would attract us to him. The prophecies said he wouldn't have anything that would appeal to us physically. And yet he radiated the glory and the beauty. If we take nothing else from this morning, please take that. The second one, definition, role of a priest. Aaron and the Levites bore the names of God's people, like on them, that like carried them into the presence of God. Exodus 28, 9 through 12 talks about their garb again. It says you should take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, the tribes. Six of their names on one stone and the names of the remaining six on the other stone in the order of their birth. So the 12 tribes sequentially listed on these pieces of onyx. And as a jeweler engraved signets, again, beautifully, the most beautiful script you can imagine, engrave the two stones with the names of the son of Israel, and it shall enclose them in settings of gold, and you shall set the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance. It was worked right into their clothing that they would carry the names of God's people on them into God's presence for prayer, intercession. It's the priestly role. Exodus 28 goes even further, and it's on their breastplate as well. 29 and 30 say, So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel in the breastpiece of judgment on his heart when he goes into the holy place to bring them to regular remembrance before the Lord. And in the breast piece of judgment, you shall put the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be on Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. And thus Aaron shall bear the judgment of the people of Israel on his heart before the Lord regularly. The role of the priest of God is to bear the people of God into God's presence to intercede on their behalf and pray for them. He must do this. This is Jesus to a T. Constantly, it says regularly, right? Constantly taking people into the presence of God, getting away to pray. This is what a priest does so centrally, so importantly. It's meant to be us as well. Do you, do I, do we carry the names of God's people into God's presence? Who is on your prayer list? Do you have a prayer list? Do you pray your prayer list? I could say yes or no to all three of those questions at different times in my life. <laughs> I don't even have a prayer list at a time. Another time I've got a prayer list, I have not used that thing. Another time I have it and I use it and it's great. Prayer list aside, do you step into God's presence on behalf of other people and say, I'm here to advocate. This brother and this sister needs healing. This marriage needs saving. These children need helping. This addiction needs breaking. This person needs love. Like, what do they need? Carry it in. That's what a priest does. It's what Jesus did. We must. If you're going to be a priest this way, this would be a great way to enter into that role. Bear the name of God's people into his presence for prayer. A third one just talks about the completeness of this. This is all of life. Hands, mouth, seeing, hearing, uh, you'll see. Exodus 29, 19 through 20 says, You shall take the other ram, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of this ram, and you shall kill the ram and take part of its blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron and on the tip of the right ears of his sons and on the thumbs of of their right hands and on the great toes of their right feet. This was not just a teacher. This was a priest dedicated that everything he might hear from the Lord and from people would be consecrated and everything he would put his hand to would be done as a hand of God, a minister of God, and that everywhere his feet took him would be consecrated to the task. This isn't a seminary position. This is a lifestyle. It's whole. It's complete. They were consecrated completely. And blood, we know, is the thing that forgives sin. So they were anointed. They were set aside in all these ways. Uh, there was a Greek and Jewish philosopher called Philo who lived around between 20 and 50 AD, somewhere in that range. And he wrote on the life of Moses. And he speaks to this specific uh, covenanting. He says, this passage signifies that the priest, called the prefect man, must be pure in every word and every action 
as a whole. For it is the hearing that judges the words, the hands that are symbols of action, and the foot that symbolizes the way a person walks through life. This is what a priest was, how he became. This is Jesus. Think of the people he listened to. He listened to the people that hated him. He listened to children. He listened to the social outcasts. He listened to the rich. He listened to the educated. He was there. He listened and then heard. This was our talk from last week. He was so good at that. But also his hands. He touched the people with rep- leprosy without being afraid that it was going to get him. He was willing to be with people that were sick and that were dirty and that were smelly and that were abused and that were cast off and that were marginalized. He just went in. And he didn't wait for people to come to him. He went to them. So if you're going to be a priest this week, are you listening to both God and to others and to yourself? What are your hands going to do this week as a way to show God's love? Where will your feet take you? Or will you sit at home being like, God's not bringing me anybody to serve. God hasn't brought me a single person to help. That's not how Jesus did the priestly role. That's not how the priests did the priestly role. Be a priest. Consecrate your life fully. The fourth thing, Aaron and the Levites, they treated and ministered to the sick. I love this. I hope that we all take part in this. Leviticus 13, 1 through 5, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, when a person has on the skin of his body a swelling or an eruption or a spot, and it turns into a case of leprous disease on the skin of his body, Then he shall be brought to Aaron, the priest, or to one of his sons, the priest. And the priest shall examine the diseased area on the skin of his body. If the hair in the diseased area has turned white and the disease appears to be deeper than the skin, it is a case of leprous disease. When the priest has examined it, he shall pronounce him unclean. But if the spot is white in the skin of his body, appears no deeper than the skin, the hair is not turned white, The priest shall shut up the diseased person for seven days, and then the priest shall examine him on the seventh day. The priests were the doctors, as well as the teachers. I hope this breaks down some kind of paradigm for you for what it means to be a pastor, for what it means to be a Christian, for what it means to be a doctor, even. These are not diverging roles. God cares not just about your heart and your mind, He cares about your body. He made you, and he wants to see you healed and whole. And he gives us miraculous examples of this and natural examples of this. And eventually in eternity, we will be completely whole. For everyone, there will be complete healing at some point, whether it's in this life and definitely in the next. So like God is into healing, and so his priests represent that to the world. If we're going to be Christians that are only interested in our programs and our teachings, but we're actually going and bringing ministry to the sick, we are not fulfilling the role of a priest completely. Think about Jesus. Did he minister to the sick? All the time. It was like one of his key three things. He taught about the kingdom, he healed the sick, and he cast out demons, right? That's like the big three. He's got his job description. If you're going to be Jesus, you've got to do these three things, right? He... So, are you Christians? Do you follow Christ? So what's that second one look like for you? How are you ministering to the sick? Do you pray for healing? Do you bring food, care in that way? Do you listen? Do you take people to hospital visits if they can't get there? Do you... What can we do to minister to the sick? The priest did, Jesus did, and Jesus does still. Jesus is still with us. Jesus is not past tense. He still ministers to the sick. And we are called to do the same. This can be seen spiritually as well, but this is not meant to be an allegory. That's just an actual sickness. But certainly, as priests, we're called to diagnose and monitor spiritual and emotional sickness just as much as physical. That's my extension of this principle. But let's not make it overly spiritualized. Let's just recognize some people need a doctor, and some people need medicine, and some people need a loving hand. And some people need prayers for healing. That's us. That's us. Who are we going to delegate that to? Nobody. The priests do that. Jesus is the priest. We're the priests. The fifth one. Aaron and the Levites entered directly into God's presence without dying. 
that's good, so they could enter in another day, because they didn't die that time they went in. But God had to specifically give instructions for how to purify themselves before they went into his presence, because the presence of God is all-consuming, is all-powerful. And so I like the fact that they had access to God, but had to do it through consecration, purification, and then entering in. Obviously, it's what Jesus did. We have the privilege of this as well. Exodus 30, 20, and 21. When these priests go into the tent of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister, burn a food offering to the Lord. To burn a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash with water so that they might not die. They shall wash their hands and their feet so that they might not die. <clears throat> This will be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his offspring throughout their generations. I, I wondered whether to like include this or not, but it just struck me. This is like the foundation of all of it. You and I cannot talk to God or come into his presence without dying because of how mighty he is and how divine he is and how small we are. Like that's the basis for everything. It's because he's so mighty and divine that we needed priests to understand and explain forgiveness and we needed Jesus to, Jesus to atone for us. We needed him to tear the curtain to give us access to God. So when we pray now, we can pray directly to God and not die. That's just a beautiful, powerful, and very foundational truth that all these other things are kind of built off of. Don't take for granted that you can pray to God. Do not take for granted that you can come into his presence. You don't deserve to talk to God face to face. I don't deserve to come into God's presence. And if I did it on my own, I would die. That's the right way to think about God. We're getting close to his glory. We're getting close to his holiness when we start thinking like that. But we can. So just let it build that gratitude and appreciation for what it means that we can. You can't just go up to a president of the United States or to an important person who's under armed guard and just push your way through and say what you want. They're protected. God is protected by his glory. Nothing will ever get to him. Nothing can attack him. He will not lose. He is so almighty that without forgiveness and purity, in this case it was washing and purification through Jesus on the cross, he tore the, the curtain in the temple and invites us to come before God. I'm going to read that passage a little bit later. You can come into God's presence. You can. And you won't die. And that should really blow our minds instead of being something that we just take for granted. Just a couple more here as we think through what it means to be a priest. I hope you're thinking, how will I do this? How will I come into God's presence? How can I minister to the sick? Like all these things, please be tracking, be applying. Uh, Aaron and the Levites had authority to sacrifice for sins. They could forgive someone their sins by doing the sacrifice. They had authority to forgive sins. They knew it was God's authority. They were the ministers, but they did it. They were the ones who did it. Leviticus 16, 16 15 says, uh, Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, that is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil. So see, there's still a veil set up here. This is just for the priests at this time, but told Jesus makes it for all Christians. Bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat in front of the mercy seat. God's presence. Then he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleannesses of the people of Israel, because of their transgressions, all their sins. And so he shall do for the tent of meeting which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanness. The Levites atoned for the sins of others. This is what a priest does. Jesus atoned for the sins of the world by dying on the cross. His blood, all sins, forever. But do you remember this in John 20, 21 about us, what Jesus said? Jesus said to his disciples, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. You know, like, receive the Spirit. I breathe into you this anointment, insp anointing, inspiration. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. And if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. 
You speak on behalf of God. We as Christians have authority to forgive sins because of the blood of Christ and Him imparting. So it's His sacrifice. We don't have the ability to save someone's soul, but we have the ability to speak God's forgiveness to a repentant heart because we minister on behalf of the high priest. We're like the Levites. God's like Aaron. We speak on behalf of him. Have you ever said to someone, I forgive you of your sins? Are you allowed to say that? Where's the Christian rule book? I don't know what page that's on. That sounds sacrilegious. Would you feel more comfortable saying, through the blood of Christ, your sins are forgiven? Might be a more accurate way to say it. Have you ever said that? Probably not. Because we reserve that for the pastors and the priests and the clergy. That's a clergy job, right? Or that's a Jesus job. Nope. Same. That's your job. Go out and forgive people of their sins this week. Not because you can like bibbidi bobbidi boo and like give them a spell to make it better, but because you'll run into people that are burdened by their sin and can't wait to get it off of them. And you speak on behalf of the high priest that can get it off of them. So say so. Do it. Would you like to pray right now and have all those sins forgiven? The person who wants that will beg for that. Yes, please, right now. Awesome. As a priest of God, I am qualified, equipped, anointed, consecrated, ordained to go and do that. Been breathed out the Holy Spirit to bring Christ's forgiveness. Again, it's not ours any more than it was the Levites, but they did it because they recognized their role. We need to be the forgivers in the world, the grace speakers, the healers, the atonement of Christ working its way into individual conversations and individual homes and apartments and bars and alleys and sidewalks and workplaces. Bring Christ's forgiveness. Don't just get someone to church so the pastor can do it. You are sent. Seven, Aaron and the Levites taught God's truth to God's people. This is just one verse, very simple. Deuteronomy 33.10. They, meaning the Levites, shall teach Jacob your rules and Israel your law. Part of the priestly job is just teach. Teach God's word. How did any of the Israelites learn it? The priests taught it. Jesus. <laughs> you come to preach the good news of the kingdom, to heal the sick. Number one, preach the word of God. He acted as a priest every time he communicated the law and love of God. We're priests. You are to communicate not just your thoughts, not just happy feelings, not just good vibes. You are to communicate the agape love of an eternal God who steps into time to save people who would be dying and eternally lost without him. That's, that's truth. That's, that's God's word. You speak that gospel. You speak that truth. You, you speak Old Testament. You speak New Testament. You speak the words the Holy Spirit puts on your heart. Bring the laws. Bring the love. Bring the truth. You have to speak it. And that's what the Levites did. That's what Jesus did. That's what we do. And the last one here, the eighth one, Aaron and the Levites, they administered justice. They were also the judges during their time. Stuff was brought to them. What's right? What's wrong? And they advocated for justice. You're going to see this is Jesus. You can think about what this means for you. But this is how it was stated in Deuteronomy 17, 8. Instructions to the people. If any case arises requiring decision between one kind of homicide or another, one kind of legal right and another, one kind of assault and another, any case within your towns that is too difficult for you, then you shall arise and go up to the place that the Lord your God will choose. And you shall come to the Levitical priests and to the judge who is in office in those days, and you shall consult them, and they shall declare to you the decision. Then you shall do according to what they declare to you from that place that the Lord will choose. And you shall be careful to do according to all that they direct you. So the priest spoke on behalf of God to help make decisions for what's right, what's wrong, how do we do things when things are difficult, when there's conflict. Like the priests were involved in administering justice in, in like Solomon's role, kind of like, what's, what's right? How do I know what God is saying? And then what they heard from God, they communicated to the people, and that gave people wisdom to know how to handle their situations. This is Jesus. 
he comes into a society that had this really big hierarchy. They were the pretty people and then there were the street people and everything in between. And he's like, that's unjust. That's not God's plan. That's your flawed human society that puts one person with all the status and one person with no opportunity. And so he goes and has meals with the lowest in society. He's administering justice. He's elevating them. He's taking his authority as the son of God and as a rabbi and saying, oh, I love these people. No one else did. And instead of saying, wow, like this, this person in position, you know, like, let me bless you. He says, why are you making such a, such a mockery of your authority? You're a hypocrite. He spoke to the injustice of rampant power, abuse of power. He spoke to the injustice of the lost, the marginalized, the lepers, the children, women, divorced, lame, blind, sick, demon-possessed. He, he just took on these causes. And it wasn't a self-promotion thing for him. A lot of times we take on causes because we're like, it'll look good if I do this thing. And I'm going to promote it that I'm doing this thing so people can know that I'm doing this really good thing. Half the time Jesus did something, he said to people, don't talk about it. Don't tell anybody. There was no self-promotion. He was just enacting just moments for people that were struggling with the injustice in their lives. Never mind the injustice of sin. Like, I feel bad for all of us. We're born into a world with it. We're born into it. That's not on us. How it's affected us and what we've done with it, how we've fallen into it ourselves, that's all on us. But like, there's an injustice to the existence of sin. Like, why? Why did these things happen to me? Why did that happen to me when I was a kid? Why did this happen at work? Why is this happening in my relations? Why? Like, this injustice of things. Why would that person say that thing? Why? Jesus is there to advocate for wisdom of God in handling situations, for finding just solutions to real problems, and for advocating for those that can't advocate for themselves. This is what the priests did. It's a priestly role. You know, the whole separation of church and state, there, there was no such thing back then. They were just God's people leading with what God told them to say. Like the priests, they would listen to God, and then it says, do whatever God told them to tell you to do. So it's still God. They were qualified because they knew the just judge, and he could tell them what justice would look like. Do you see how this fills Jesus' role perfectly? How he died for us to enact justice? When we couldn't do it on our own, we can't atone for ourselves, but he did. He brought justice when we couldn't get it on ourselves, on our own. So the question is, are you, am I, advocating for justice? Are we living that out? Or are we sort of like sitting back and we're like, man, this world is a mess while we sit at home and do absolutely nothing about it. That doesn't sound like Jesus. That doesn't sound like someone who has their hands and their feet and their ears anointed to go out and live God's presence in the presence. That doesn't sound like that. So where are the people in your life that are struggling with unfairness, with being poorly treated, with having consequences of injustice? What can you do to help? That sounds like a priest to me. And don't just refer them to your church. Don't just say, come to church. Come to my pastor. Talk to my pastor. Here's a good book. You are the priests. Minister to them. Help them find and seek justice. You represent a just God. That's your job. You're his priest. These are the eight roles that I saw this week. I'm sure there's a million more. There's entirely whole books, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, set aside just to the tasks of the priests and the laws of God. I would love to encourage you to read more into those, thinking not like, wow, how old-fashioned this is, how archaic. Are we sacrificing bulls and goats again? Look into it as acts of worship. Look into it for what it can show you about God the Father. Look into what it meant to be a priest of God and identify with that. So to bring it all to a, a close, let's just remember. Jesus 
was and is clothed with glory and beauty. He bore our names in prayer. He still bears our names, all of our names in prayer before God. Jesus was and is completely consecrated and holy in every aspect of his existence. Jesus ministered to the sick and he still ministers to the sick. Jesus entered into God's presence daily. He stands in God's presence directly. Jesus sacrificed himself to provide forgiveness. He still grants forgiveness. He taught God's word. He still teaches God's word to everyone. And he administered and fought for justice. And he still fights for justice and against evil. So what does that mean for us? Are we clothed with glory and beauty? Do we bear people's names in prayer? Are we consecrated and holy in every aspect of our lives? Are we ministering to the sick? Are we entering into God's presence continually? Are we using our authority to bring forgiveness, grant forgiveness? Are we teaching God's word? And are we promoting justice and denouncing evil? If you're willing to experiment with even one or one percent of one of those th things this week, it's a beginning of you walking into your role and growing into your role as a priest of God. Tracy, maybe you could put up that one last scripture, 1 Peter 2.9, where it says, We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. This is who we are. So if you are an apprentice of Jesus, I pray that you will bear it well. If you're not, but you're looking for help with the unjust aspects of your life, ask a Christian to help you. Maybe that'll be the nudge that Christian needs to do the thing that they're supposed to be doing. If you're not a follower of Jesus, but you need to be prayed for, ask a Christian to pray for you. Not just a pastor Christian, but a Christian Christian. An everybody Christian. Because that's what they're supposed to be doing for you, and they won't know unless you say something. So say something. Ask for prayer. If you uh, are sick, Ask a Christian for help, not just your doctor or your neighbor, because that's what a Christian's supposed to be doing. It's their role in the world. Like, help them fulfill their role. If you need forgiveness, if you want to know what God's Word says, if any of these things, like, ask a Christian. They may not know what to do with your question, and they may completely botch in their response, but you're giving them an opportunity to grow into the role and to ask the Holy Spirit to use them for what we're being called to be, priests. Not me versus you or us versus us. It's us and the Lord Jesus and that beautiful, powerful umbilical cord of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us that we receive and we give. We receive and we give. So I would pray that this week your faith experiments would look like you healing the sick and forgiving the sinners, creating justice where what didn't exist before, speaking God, all these things. And then if you look around the room at all the people here, what if everybody was doing that? And if you think of all the Christians in the world, what if all the Christians were doing that? Now you get a glimpse of what the kingdom of heaven is supposed to look like. It's a kingdom of priests. It's a holy nation. So there's my challenge to you this morning. It's as much a challenge to me. I pray that you will live that out. It is who you are. Let's close in a word of prayer. Jesus as the highest priest the name above all names, please fill us with your spirit that we may be like you. And in small, small ways, be Christ-like. Thank you for asking us to step into this monumental role. Uh, without you, there is no chance. But with you, we would be so privileged to be involved in the greatest things that could possibly happen. Please bring your kingdom, build your kingdom, and use us in whatever way you see fit this week. In Jesus' name we pray.